What I want to think about now is the importance of the compartmentalization of body fluids in recovery from hemorrhage. So let's start with a simple diagram. Here we have, a, here we have an arteriole and this is taking blood to a group of capillaries. And as you know, the capillaries have semi-permeable membranes. So there's one capillary there. Here's another capillary. So we have two capillaries. In practice, of course, there's going to be a lot more than that. And here we have the blood draining from a venule. So blood entering via an arteriole, circulating through the capillaries, leaving via a venule. And of course, the capillary is perfusing a tissue. So we have tissue cells in this area as well. There we have the tissue cells. As we've already noted, the hydrostatic pressure in normal physiology is relatively high at the arterial end of the capillary. It's higher than the osmotic pressure, therefore the tissue fluid is going to be formed. So tissue fluid will be formed at the arterial end of the capillary and we will have large volumes of fluid in the interstitial compartment as the blood has been pushed through from the intravascular compartment under the influence of hydrostatic pressure. The blood pressure within the intravascular compartment. As we know, there's plasma proteins in the blood and that will osmotically reabsorb tissue fluid at the venous end of the capillary. That's the normal situation. But in hemorrhage, there's loss of blood. And in hemorrhage, if you think about it, whole blood is lost. So red cells are lost. Plasma water is lost. Plasma proteins are lost. It's all lost. There's hemorrhage. The blood is lost from the intravascular compartment and that's going to reduce the volume of blood in the intravascular compartment. In haemorrhage a hypovolemia will start to develop. Now it's absolutely vital that blood pressure is maintained to perfuse the tissues of the body. Without blood pressure you cannot perfuse the tissues of the body. So if there's a loss of blood that's recognised by various mechanisms and there is sympathetic stimulation, sympathetic outflow from the medulla oblongata of the brain. And part of what that sympathetic outflow does is it causes peripheral vasoconstriction. So there's going to be per peripheral vasoconstriction. And that's in an attempt to maintain blood pressure. So there's constriction in the larger arteries to some extent, but particularly there's constriction of the arterioles. And to facilitate that, around about the end of the arteriole, before the blood goes into the capillaries, as you probably know, there are rings of smooth muscle that comprise the pre-capillary sphincter. So this is, these are the capillaries here, this is the arteriole, this is the pre-capillary sphincter. Sympathetic activity after haemorrhage Let's imagine that's a sympathetic nerve coming down here. Sympathetic stimulation will contract that muscle, causing contraction of the pre-capillary sphincter. There's going to be a vasoconstriction. That's good because it will help to maintain blood pressure. But if there's constriction of the pre-capillary sphincter here, What's that going to do to the volumes of blood that are able to get through that reduced lumen into the capillary beds? Well, I think you can see if there's a pre-capillary sphincter contraction, that's going to reduce the lumen of the arteriole, meaning the volumes of blood that get into the capillaries is going to be reduced. 
So even though low blood pressure may be maintained in the arterial system, there's going to be a relative hypoperfusion of the tissues of the body as a result of the precapillary sphincter vasoconstriction. So there's going to be less blood in the capillaries. If there's less blood in the capillaries, what's that going to do to the pressure of the blood in the capillaries? Well, if less blood is getting through, the pressure in the capillaries is going to be reduced. Now, we know that tissue fluid is formed at the arterial end of the capillary because the hydrostatic pressure is greater than the osmotic pressure. And we know that tissue fluid is reabsorbed at the venous end of the capillary because the osmotic pressure is greater than the hydrostatic pressure. But because there's less blood getting into the capillary, now the pressure of blood in all parts of the capillary will be reduced. There's going to be reduced blood pressure, that is reduced hydrostatic pressure, in the capillaries. Well, what does this mean? Well, there's two things. Firstly, it means less tissue fluid will be formed at the arterial end of the capillary because there's less pressure in the capillaries pushing it out. In fact, virtually none, if there's been a significant hemorrhage, essentially no fluid will be formed at the arterial end of the capillary. No tissue fluid will be formed. At the venous end of the capillary, the pressure is going to be very much reduced. So that means if there's less pressure there, there's less outgoing hydrostatic pressure to resist the ing-sucking osmotic pressure. So you're going to get greatly increased reabsorption of tissue fluids. So you're going to get reduced formation of tissue fluid at the arterial end. That means you're going to get less fluid going from the intravascular compartment into the interstitial compartment. And further along the capillary, you're going to get greatly increased reabsorption of tissue fluid. And this will happen straight away because if you lose whole blood, can you see you're losing water, red cells and plasma proteins? You're losing the lot. So initially after hemorrhage, the concentration of red cells and the concentration of plasma proteins in the intravascular compartment will actually be the same. So you've still got your plasma proteins, your osmotic pressure is still going to be about 25 millimetres, millimetres of mercury sucking in because you've still got the same concentration of plasma proteins, but the pressure is going to be lower. So the net effect is you're going to get movement of water from the interstitial compartment into the intravascular compartment. That, of course, is absolutely brilliant because that's going to restore intravascular volume and that will prevent hypovolemic shock. And, of course, hypovolemic shock is going to kill you. So if you lose a certain amount of blood, that can be restored by this transcapillary refill mechanism, the transcapillary refill mechanism. And this was noted almost 100 years ago in the First World War, when patients who'd been traumatised with battlefield injuries were brought into a medical facility, and when their blood was taken, even just one hour after the injury, it was noted that their blood was significantly diluted. Because although initially we said that the plasma protein concentration and the red cell concentration will be the same, because you've got a net movement of water from the, intravascular, from the interstitial into the intravascular compartment after hemorrhage, it's moving from the tissue fluid into the plasma, that means you're going to get lots of water from the tissue fluid going into the plasma and I think you can see that's going to dilute the plasma. So they found out that patients were being emitted in the First World War, but the blood was diluted. And this mechanism explains that. You get dilution of the blood, but that's a lot better than having hypovolemia, because you're maintaining intravascular volume. You have to maintain intravascular volume to promote your chances of, of surviving the situation. Now, it's interesting that even after just one hour, studies have shown that about 75% of intravascular volume can be restored via this mechanism of transcapillary 
refill. So just one hour after a significant hemorrhage, blood volume can be 75% restored. You can, if you've lost one litre of blood, then 750 mils can be, can be reabsorbed from the interstitial fluid. So you're going to restore fluid volume. But in the Second World War, they noted something equally interesting. They noted that a few hours after someone had been traumatised and lost a lot of blood, they might be deficient in red cells. The hematocrit would be low. But what they found out, that the plasma protein levels were not low. They'd been restored. Because if you think about it, the transcapillary refill, yes, it's going to dilute the amount of red cells, but you'd expect it to dilute the plasma, to, to dilute the concentration of the plasma proteins as well. And in the Second World War, within a few hours of injury, they found that the amount of plasma proteins had been restored, which of course is good because that maintains intravascular osmotic pressure, meaning that the fluid can be sucked in, continuing to maintain intravascular volume. So what this means is that after hemorrhage, there's an increased production of plasma proteins as an emergency measure to keep the level of plasma proteins up. Now, this might happen as a direct effect of the sympathetic stimulation, or it may be that the liver recognises the reduced concentration of plasma proteins. Because if you think about it, the hemodilution is going to reduce the concentration of plasma proteins. If that's then recognised by the liver, the liver can bunk up the production of plasma proteins and restore the amount of plasma proteins relatively quickly. It's going to take longer to replace the red cells unless you've got a blood transfusion. But loss of red cells will stimulate the production of new red blood cells by the red bone marrow. So what this means is that after hemorrhage, OK, if there's a torrential big loss of hemorrhage, that can kill you straight away. But if a moderate amount of blood is lost, then you're going to have sympathetic compensations, transcapillary refill, will restore intravascular volume and as we've said 75% of the lost volume can be replaced within an hour. That's going to maintain the blood pressure, that means people can take action, they can stay alive, they can wait for the medics to come and rescue them, they're going to stay alive until they get to a good medical facility to be treated. Or if they can't get to a good medical facility to be treated, it's still going to increase their chances of survival because they will restore their intravascular volume. Therefore, they will maintain their blood pressure. And again, this mechanism of transcapillary refill is all predicated on the compartmentalization of body fluids in the intravascular, interstitial and intracellular compartments and the fact that fluid can move between these compartments, in this case moving from the cells in the tissue fluids into the intravascular compartment to maintain circulating blood volume and therefore blood pressure.